Is ChatGPT going to replace network engineers? I'm JB, this is Cyber Insight, and today we're going to be talking about one of the most popular artificial intelligence tools and seeing how it lines up uh, against a normal network engineer. So we're going to run it through its paces, see how it does, but make sure you stick around to the end because we are going to be talking to an authoritative source on artificial intelligence and seeing what they have to say about it. So I'm going to hop over my browser, but first, do me a solid, make sure you smash that like button, subscribe to the channel, and when you do do that, make sure that you turn on the notifications so you don't miss when I drop new content. So here we are with ChatGPT. We're going to ask it some pretty basic network engineering questions and see if it can actually help us design a network. So let's just start with something really simple. Let's say that we want to create a network. Uh, let's say we want it with five VLANs. Let's just see what it says. Now, when it comes to asking ChatGPT questions, I always ask, please, just because I want to stay on its good side if it ever becomes completely sentient. So we're going to ask it to design a network with, let's say, five VLANs. Please design a network with five VLANs. So we see here, it's gonna determine the VLANs. It's gonna make up some names for it, that's cool. We can go ahead and change those. It gives them uh, different VLAN IDs. And then it assigns each a IP address, uh, RFC 1918, 192, 168, whatever. So these are slash 24 addresses. And then it ends up saying which switch ports need to be connected for which VLAN. Does that help us? Not really, but good that it at least is knowing to identify breaking things out between VLANs. Then it knows that we need to configure uh, VLAN or inter-VLAN routing. So it's going to end up having us create some interfaces here, whether or not we wanted to go sub-interfaces or where we wanted these uh, gateways to be. You know, they're kind of making a guess here. Um, and then it talks about configuring VLAN trunks. So is this good? Yeah, there's some useful information from here. Let's give it a little bit more specific information and see how it comes back with that. So please design a network with five VLANs. Let's say one each for management, workstations, printers, security, and phones. Now let's see what they do here. All right, so now it took the specific information that we gave it in regards to what we want the VLANs to be for. It did that, and it looks like it's gonna just kind of cycle through the same stuff. This time we see it switched up the private IP space that it was giving us. So this time it's doing a 10 network, again, still slash 24 networks. So again, not perfect, but you know, a step in the right direction. You know, the thing that I find that works the best with this is you kind of iterate over your questions and get more specific. And the more specific you get, the better type of answers you're gonna get. So let's then add the management network must support 20 devices. The workstation network must support 150 devices. And the printer network must support, let's just say, six devices. All right, let's, let's even go less than that. Let's go, must support four devices. So we see it came back. It didn't necessarily craft these in any way. It's still sticking with those slash 24s. It would be nice if it maybe were to break those up a little bit. I don't know if you necessarily need to be using slash 24s. So this time we'll iterate again and see if we can actually get it to subnet something that isn't overly sized. Okay, so now it comes back and it looks like it is actually giving us maybe some better answers here with something that is sized more appropriately with different sizes of subnets. But when we look at this, I don't know where it got 510 devices from. It says I only wanted 150. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. 20 devices for management. Okay, so slash 27 makes sense. This one could have stayed a 24, and this one makes sense. So it's kind of getting it right. Maybe, maybe not. Assigning switch port. These are some wild numbers. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, I don't know how valid that really is there. Let's see if we can get a little bit more granular information again. So we do the same thing. You know, let's change this to 350 devices for the workstation. Please provide the subnet mask and gateway for each VLAN. And let's see what this comes back with now. Okay, so that's starting to be some usable information. Configure switch ports, that actually is a much better answer than uh, some random high number interfaces that don't exist in the real world. And they do talk that this is basic 
and needs to be configured uh, in a more specific way. So this isn't horrible. It gets us going in the right direction, especially if you weren't quite sure what steps you needed to do to kind of start heading down this path. This at least gives you, you know, some high level things to make sure that you're identifying and planning for. So let's see if we can add a little bit more complexity to this and see how it responds. So let's say in uh, the VLANs and the management VLAN is going to be domain controllers and we have workstations and we want to make sure that we are securing the communication back and forth between those. One thing that we don't want is unobstructed data flows between different VLANs, especially when we're talking about Windows devices, because if we do that, you have the very real possibility of having some serious and negative security implications. So let's see if it can do this. And we're going to also ask it to try to create some ACLs for us to lock down this traffic. So let's see, we're going to say the management VLAN has two domain controllers. Please write Cisco ACLs to protect the data flows between the workstation VLAN and the management VLAN. Only allow the required ports. All right, let's see how this goes. So we're back at it. We knock out the VLANs, IP assignments based on the sizes, and we'll kind of just see how this goes. Got the router interfaces, and we'll kind of see how this comes out. Now, the cool thing with this is it does have it kind of in a, in a screen using cascading style sheets that allows us to actually copy the Cisco configurations. And this is not uh, very helpful to us. Here's an example ACL that allows only HTTP and HTTP from the workstation to the man and only 389 and Kerberos from the management VLAN to the workstation VLAN. So some good things, at least they realize that we need multiple ACLs, one going from workstation to uh, the domain controllers and then vice versa. But this is not necessarily the rules <laughs> that we would necessarily want. I mean, they only have AD443. You still would need Kerberos. I mean, they don't have, they don't, didn't even print out the Kerberos ports here. No LDAP S, um, no DNS in here anywhere. Um, again, we can iterate through this and try and, and get to the point that, that we need, but this definitely, you know, right off the cuff is not uh, overly helpful in any way. I would also say it's not incredibly locked down. I mean, we're talking about the whole slash 27 versus locked down to two IP addresses. So again, we could iterate and ask more questions uh, to see how that comes back uh, to get it locked down. So the data flows would be from the workstation subnet just to those particular uh, domain controllers. So let's see if we can tweak the language here at all. And we'll change this just to Windows domain controllers. Please write Cisco ACLs to protect the communication. Let's see, between the workstation VLAN and the management VLAN, I will only allow the required ports. Ensure communication is configured only to the required IP addresses. So let's see if this will actually force it to give specific IP addresses to the domain controllers. All right, so this actually looks a little bit better and more in line with what I would be expecting to see. Much better from a port perspective. And they're kind of showing you how you would do this. And then they're giving us specific IP addresses. So it kind of dropped out the rest of the information that we were looking at up here, but a little bit better. Definitely the ports are much better. It's still not perfect. It's missing some ports still. For instance, uh, we normally would have the, the higher end port range. I think it's like 42,000 something up through 56,000 something that we see a lot of other response traffic coming on there. Uh, there's no TCP established statement here in this ACL. So that could get a little bit dicey as well. And I kind of just have this limited to one IP address going to another IP address versus the whole subnet versus that. Again, part of that is the information that we're providing it, but Part of it is also its ability to not be able to process things in the way. So it does have this listed as uh, individual host to another individual host, although what we wanted here was the entire subnet to both of the hosts. So we'd still have to modify this. So it, not quite all the way up to where we could just ask it to do something. And it's gonna put out something that you should feel comfortable going and putting 
into an operational environment anywhere. Again, it's giving useful information, it's giving you uh, a push or a step in the right direction, but it's not taking anyone's job anytime soon. Uh, let's see one more thing. Let's see if we can get it to create a secure configuration for us. So we're going to say, please then put it into a secure Cisco switch configuration using Cisco switch best practices. We'll just see what it comes back with. So this is good. This is helpful. Creating VLANs. I don't necessarily know about uh, IP address under the VLANs like that. Normally we'd use an interface VLAN. Switch port ranges go into the VLANs. That's cool. Configure trunk port to router firewall. Okay. It's not bad. Mm, we're taking it and applying that. And now some switch best practices. Service password encryption. Mm, no IP, no IP. Domain lookup, logging synchronous, so no CDP run. Some spanning tree stuff. So uh, not exactly the best. I would think that they would use something like a CIS benchmark or uh, just a stig or something like that to provide a secure configuration. But again, some best practices, but not something... Uh, that you would just take and expect to, to completely do the job. So I think from looking through all of this stuff, uh, we see some good stuff. We see some ways that we could learn and find out new information that we might not be familiar with. But I think a lot of what comes into play with being a network engineer is knowing a lot of the nuances, the right questions to ask and how things all work together. And what this does is it's giving us uh, some information that's helpful, but it's a bit disjointed and it's not the complete picture. So one last thing we wanted to get from an authority authoritative source, someone who knows quite a bit about artificial intelligence, what they think as far as the possibility of chat GPT replacing network engineers. Let's see what chat GPT itself says about this possibility. All right, so chat GPT says it will not be replacing network engineers. Thank goodness we all are safe. Uh, it's a tool that can assist network engineers and we've seen that in the ways that it's helped out uh, during uh, the different questions that we've asked it. It can help in generating configurations, troubleshooting, providing recommendations. However, network engineering involves more than just configuring devices. It also involves understanding business requirements, designing networks, deploying and maintaining devices, and ensuring network security. Network engineers have specialized knowledge and skills that ChatGPT does not possess, such as physical installation and cabling, complex network design, and hands-on troubleshooting. It's a lot of intrinsic knowledge that network engineers have that chat GPT is just not going to have and is, is not going to be able to kind of take the different pieces of the puzzle and put them all together. So while it's a valuable tool for network engineers, I think we all can agree it's not going to replace the experience of a skilled network engineer. We all can sleep safe at night. So uh, hope you appreciated the video. Hope you found this entertaining. Make sure that you do smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, go get at it, have a great week, and uh, we'll be talking soon.